Hey, this is Dr. K from my medical school. Today I want to focus on a bacteria that has led to significant decrease in patients' quality of life, healthcare costs, and change the way we prescribe antibiotics. Make sure to check out our other free educational videos at our YouTube channel, iMedicalSchool. In addition, you can follow us on Twitter at iMedSchool and Facebook at iMedicalSchool. Clostridium difficile is a well-known bacteria that has led to more than $5 billion in healthcare costs and led to more than 20,000 deaths within the United States. As the name conveys, Clostridium difficile, otherwise known as C. diff, can be a difficult bacteria to treat, with up to 30% of people developing a recurrence of their infection. My goal today is to highlight the key points in the new guidelines released by the Infectious Disease Society of America so we can get a better handle on this devastating infection. Whenever a person presents with diarrhea, we need to think about infection as the number one differential diagnosis. To begin with, it is important to investigate what someone means by diarrhea. Those with at least three loose bowel wounds per day should be considered for testing for C. diff. Risk factors that can place someone at risk for C. diff are recent antibiotic use, advanced age, multiple medical problems, use of immunosuppressive medications like chemotherapy, and exposure to a healthcare facility like a hospital, extended care facility, or dialysis center. Now the next question is, how do we diagnose C. diff? We diagnose C. diff based on stool tests, but there are quite a variety of stool tests available. Testing for C. diff can be quite complicated. The two main methods for testing are the glutamate dehydrogenase with toxin test and the nucleic acid amplification test. Of all the tests available, these tests are the most sensitive. The glutamate dehydrogenase test in simple terms is when a sample from stool is cultured in various growth media. Then if C. diff is isolated, then a test to look for production of toxin is performed. A nucleic acid amplification test detects the genes that produce the toxin created by C. diff. Nucleic acid amplification tests are good tests, but the positive predictive value are lower. No matter which of these tests are used, remember the, that only testing patients with diarrhea is far more important than the particular test we use, as we do not want to treat people who have C. diff in their normal flora. Once C. diff is diagnosed, the next step is to understand treatment. We decide proper treatment based on the severity of infection. Severity is categorized as non-severe, severe, and fulmitant. If a person with C. diff has a leukocytosis or an elevated white blood cell count of less than 15,000 and a creatinine less than 1.5, they are considered to have a non-severe infection. Previously, non-severe infections were treated with flagell, but current recommendations dictate that we use vancomycin or fidoxamycin in a non-severe initial episode. Vancomycin, 125 mg four times daily for 10 days, or fidoxamycin, 200 mg twice daily for 10 days, is recommended. The reason for the change in this recommendation is that studies have shown vancomycin and fidoxamycin are superior to metronidazole in mild to moderate episodes when looking at cure rate. If these regimens cannot be used, then you can consider metronidazole 500 mg three times daily for 10 days. This is a major change from prior recommendations where flagell was considered first-line therapy for initial non-severe infections. Interestingly, vancomycin and fidoxamycin had similar cure rates, but fidoxamycin achieved a statistically significant difference in sustained clinical response meaning no recurrence occurred 25 days later. Fidoxamycin achieved a sustained clinical response of 71%, while vancomycin achieved a sustained clinical response of only 57%. Severe infections are when someone with C. diff has a leukocytosis greater than 15,000 and a creatinine of greater than 1.5 mg per deciliter. The absolute value for the creatinine is one of the big differences in the new guidelines. Previously, the creatinine during infection was compared to a baseline value to decide on the severity of the illness. Those with severe infections are more likely to be encountered in the hospital setting, 
and if they are outpatient, will likely need admission for further management and hydration. Severe episodes should be treated with vancomycin, 125 mg four times daily for 10 days, or fidoxamycin, 200 mg twice daily for 10 days. Metronidazole is not an acceptable backup regimen. Lastly, fulminant episodes are when the infection becomes out of control and the person develops hypotension, shock, or an ileus. An ileus is when bowel peristalsis stops in a section leading to an obstruction. Many times this is related to electrolyte imbalance like hypokalemia, which commonly occurs with severe diarrhea. In addition, there's a phenomenon called megacolon. This is when the entire colon severely dilates, leading to pain, decreased bowel sounds, and an acute abdomen. I've only seen this happen once, but it's unmistakable. And this is why abdominal examination is so important. Treatment of fulminant episodes previously characterized as severe, complicated infections begins with oral vancomycin of 500 mg four times per day. If there is an ileus present, then vancomycin 500 mg is placed in one liter of normal saline and administered rectally as a retention enema. In addition, IV metronidazole should also be used at 500 mg every eight hours. Keep in mind that if someone develops a megacolon, surgery is likely and will be the treatment of choice as antibiotics may not have time to work before a colonic perforation occurs. Typically, a subtotal colectomy is completed, where the entire colon is removed except for the rectum. An ileostomy is created generally as a temporary measure. An ileostomy is when the ileum, the last part of the small bowel, is fixed to the abdominal wall to create an ostomy and bowel contents empty into an ostomy bag. When the inflammation decreases, depending on various factors, the ileostomy is connected to what is left of the rectum to mimic normal anatomy. An alternative surgery is to create a laparoscopic loop ileostomy. First off, this is not an open surgery, and the colon, as well as the rectum, are left in place. Essentially, the ileum is cut and both ends of the cut surface are attached to the abdominal wall to create two openings. One opening is where the small bowel exits, and the other opening is where antegrade vancomycin can be infused to enter the colon and rectum. This surgery allows for normal peristalsis, but also lets medications to be infused through the second part of the ostomy directly into the colon. Unfortunately, C. diff recurrence is quite common, and we need to be prepared what to do if someone develops a recurrent infection. For a first recurrence, we give a pulse or tapered regimen, rather than repeating the standard 10-day regimen. A tapered regimen is vancomycin, 125 mg four times daily for 10 to 14 days, then 125 mg two times daily for a week, then 125 mg once daily for a week, then 125 mg once every two or three days for two to eight weeks. This allows the C. diff to be suppressed while normal bowel flora is restored. Another possibility is to give a 10-day course of fidoxamycin if vancomycin was used previously. If metronidazole or flagyl was used as initial treatment, then use a standard 10-day course of vancomycin. If someone develops more than one recurrence, then try a pulsed and tapered vancomycin regimen, or a standard course of vancomycin followed by rifaximin, or fidoxamycin. If someone has multiple recurrences with failure of antibiotic therapy, then consider a fecal transplant. A fecal transplant is when stool from someone who has no significant diseases is placed into a C. diff-affected colon. This can be accomplished via colonoscopy, enema, and J-tube, and possibly in the future, a tablet. By infusing normal stool, the normal bacteria that line the colon are reintroduced the normal bacteria are able to compete against the C. diff and help get rid of the infection. Now that we've talked about treatment, we need to highlight other important steps during an infection. The number one thing I tell patients is to practice very good hand hygiene to prevent reinfecting themselves and from spreading the infection to others. It's important to bleach all surfaces as C. diff forms spores that are difficult to kill with non-bleach cleaners. These include bathrooms, kitchen countertops, and dining tables at the very minimum. They should isolate themselves to one bathroom in the house if they can to prevent transmission. 
Commonly, I receive questions regarding if someone should take probiotics or not. Currently, there is no significant data to truly support the use of probiotics. There is no evidence that probiotics lead to less severe infection, prevent recurrence, or lead to faster clearance of the infection. Now that we've reviewed the basics regarding the new Infectious Disease Society of America guidelines, try to employ these key points into your practice. If you like this video, give this video a like. Make sure to share this video with your friends and classmates. If you have any questions or comments, place them down below. And most importantly, subscribe. This is Dr. K from My Medical School, and I'll see you next time.